Hello, this is a brief presentation of my uh, on-demand symposium at the Fifth International Brain Stimulation Conference. The topic is neurovascular modulation in response to electrical stimulation. These are my disclosures, and these slides are available through the conference app uh, and also online through my Twitter account. So neuromodulation, the topic of this conference, includes many techniques. What they all share in common is they intentionally apply energy to the nervous system in a directed way, either for an experimental or therapeutic purpose. And so some would be implanted, uh, some uh, require visits to a medical center, uh, and some are battery powered and you can walk around with them or deploy them in a wide range of environments. But what they all share is in the case of electrical stimulation devices, the energy uh, is electricity that is directed towards specific brain tissues to change function. And so I'm going to be talking about neurovascular modulation as something that actually applies to all these techniques. And I'm not suggesting it as a new technology per se, though it can guide technology creation, but rather a mechanistic explanation for things that have been going on all along. And so, of course, the traditional target for neuromodulation mechanisms are neurons. And this makes perfect sense. It's something that I myself have studied for over a decade using a brain slice preparation. And it is unequivocal uh, that neurons, including in a brain slice, where incidentally vasculature is absent, that these neurons respond directly to electrical stimulation. And my lab and others have published extensive work on oscillations and plasticity and neural processing explaining in detail how different forms of electrical stimulation can modulate brain activity. So I wanna say up front that none of that is in doubt. So that's fine. But what I wanna say is that perhaps there is a parallel mechanism or a supplementary mechanism, and that is neurovascular modulation. And I'm gonna explain neurovascular modulation in terms of three aspects, and these are the first two. Um, the first one involves understanding that the brain is a coupled neurovascular system. The second one is really the heart of the talk, which is talking about direct stimulation of the vasculature and blood-brain barrier. But starting with the first aspect, everyone understands uh, the brain function is inherently linked um, to the delivery of, of metabolites, the clearance of, of, of reactants. Um, this is neurovascular coupling, which is traditionally understood as when neurons are active, they call for more nutrients, they call for more blood supply um, as a result of it. And this is, for example, the basis of many neuroimaging techniques, such as fMRI, which is hemodynamic based. So in the first aspect of neurovascular modulation, it's simply to say that when we try to explain how neuromodulation works, Maybe we should not be completely ignoring the vasculature and the blood-brain barrier. Maybe because the neurons and the vasculature are so tightly coupled, explaining the outcomes of stimulation requires the understanding of this entire unit, which also includes glia. Now, the second aspect is a bit more nuanced. It, said, it says, what if during electrical stimulation, we are directly stimulating the vascular themselves, the blood-brain barrier, and then the neurons follow. And you see this, this reverses the traditional order of neurovascular coupling. Now, it's not the neurons going first and the blood vessels responding in, in, in response to their demands. It's actually stimulating the, the vasculature or the blood-brain barrier first. And that now triggers a cascade that does eventually modulate neuronal function. And so I want to think about this, for example, in the context of transcranial direct current stimula stimulation or TDCS. Um, here we have electrodes placed on the scalp, current is passed through the brain, and traditionally we would imagine that neurons are being modulated, but the brain is full of both large and small capillaries. Um, and it is in fact known that TDCS, like all neuromodulation techniques, produce a profound hemodynamic response, but it is typically considered to be an epiphenomenon, meaning you are measuring hemodynamic responses, could be FNIRs, cerebral blood flow directly, um, fMRI. You're measuring these 
blood responses as echoes of the direct neuronal stimulation. But what if they're not echoes? What if you're actually directly measuring the mechanism of stimulation? And this question is hard to answer in the intact brain because you have neurons and you have vascular, and because of neurovascular coupling, they're, they're intricately linked. So the question I would want to ask is, okay, well, hypothetically, if you didn't have the neurons there and just the vascular system, would it respond independently to stimulation, therefore supporting the hypothesis that when the neurons and the vascular are there, the vascular system might respond first? Now, you can't do this in, in, in vivo. Uh, so to address this question, we went to some animal models. And again, it's a hard question to answer because if you have in vivo the neurons and the vascular present and you get a response in both, the default is to assume that you stimulated the neurons and the vascular is an epiphenomenon. So in order to push back against that rational logic, we need a system where there are no neurons and the systems like that do exist. One of them is a model of the blood-brain barrier, a sheet of endothelial cells that form the, the, the blood-brain barrier that is essentially grown in, in a well. And that well is, is, is in a dish and, and this is a well-established model of blood-brain barrier function, transvascular transport. Uh, you can monitor the transport of different molecules. You can look for molecular changes uh, uh, in the endothelial cells themselves. You can look at water transport. The, uh, and there are those cells there. And, and by the way, they, they form a tight junction. And this is very important that the endothelial cells uh, that form your, your blood vessels um, are very tightly sealed to each other, forming the blood-brain barrier because the transport of molecules between the lumen inside the blood vessels and the brain, the paractima, must be very tightly regulated. And so that's why you're seeing those tight junctions. And so the only modification we did to the system is we added electrodes to the top and the bottom, and now we can electrically stimulate these endothelial cells directly. What did we find? And I will refer you to all these papers I'm just going to go through this very quickly. One of the primary things we found is that direct current stimulation across the blood-brain barrier drove water flow. That's what this bubble displacement or the JV is referring to. When we turned on stimulation, for the time that we applied stimulation, we accelerated water flow in the direction of current flow so that it was polarity specific. And it turned out this was something that we should have expected based on the phenomenon of electroosmosis, which says that when you push current through tight spaces, and by tight spaces, I mean the spaces between the endothelial cells, and when those spaces happen to have negative charges on their surface, water will be dragged with it. And in fact, the amount of water flow we saw was directly predicted uh, by the theory of electroosmosis. We went on to show in a series of papers that when water is dragged, it can drag molecules with it, small molecules, and large molecules. And that water drag is a powerful signal to the endothelial cells themselves, triggering a whole variety of early gene expressions, molecular changes, changes that um, I'm gonna call for the purpose of this talk, plasticity, because they outlast the duration of stimulation. And these are changes that can lead to lasting changes both in the vascular function or uh, in the surrounding neuronal, neuronal population. So we have an acute effect and we have a lasting effect. Now, I want to say briefly, this is not just for direct current stimulation. It also happens for high intensity pulsed by phasic pulses, as might occur during DBS, ECT, TMS, basically every form of electrical stimulation. And we can see both water transport changes and other molecular changes as well. Now, it turns out the kind of changes you see are going to depend on waveform. So, okay, that makes sense. Uh, neuromodulation is waveform dependent. The effects of stimulation on vascular function and blood-brain barrier function will also be waveform dependent. And again, in this case, we're also seeing changes at the molecular level. So things that are supporting lasting plastic-like changes. Across all these things, we do have sort of one general theory to explain what's going on. As we apply stimulation through the brain, some of that current will cross across the blood-brain barrier, so from the paractima into the blood vessels and the other way, and it will preferentially flow in the spaces between the cells, um, these uh, tight junctions, these gaps between them, and as it does, it will drag water through them. 
Uh, and that will then lead to the what we believe is all these other cascades of, 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 of transport and molecular changes. We have no evidence uh, under conditions we tested for individual cell electroporation or damage. Um, and everything I'm showing you here should happen in any part of the nervous system. Any part of the nervous system is densely um, uh, innervated with blood vessels, with capillaries. And so this should be a universal effect from peripheral to central stimulation. And again, I want to refer you to a series of ongoing studies that we've done on this topic, looking at things like the fact that the stimulation um, uh, can broadly boost transport mechanisms across the brain, which will support metabolism, which will enhance excitability and plasticity. We're looking also directly at the ability of the flow produced by stimulation to act as a clearance mechanism, which in, it's, in itself could have therapeutic potentials uh, in things like um, a variety of neurodegenerative diseases where you're seeing accumulation of plaques um, uh, in the parachnema. And so we're, we're developing models of that as well. And finally, uh, there's this notion that you could use this now in a neuroprotective role, meaning there may be a situation, let's say in an acute emergency, where you want to transiently boost, boost blood flow to a brain region. And now you can use these types of neuromodulation techniques to do that. And so to conclude, when we think about neurovascular modulation, uh, we just need to start with the first principle that the neurons are not alone in the brain. Uh, and so when you're stimulating neurons, you must be stimulating these other structures. But maybe you're stimulating these other structures first. And I want to mention that just like neuronal stimulation is many things, neurovascular stimulation is many things with many possible tar targets um, that are waveform dependent. Final few thoughts um, that I'll go through very briefly and refer you to these papers. We have found using computational models that the blood-brain barrier acts as a powerful concentrator of electric field. So that, for example, in TDCS, which produces less than one volt per meter in this vicinity around neurons, we get hundreds of volts per meter across the blood-brain barrier. And that amplification factor happens across techniques so that in cases like DBS, TMS, and ECT, where you are already at about 100 or more volt per meter around the neurons, you can exceed 10,000 volt per meter across the blood-brain barrier. And so that um, this is a model, but if that idea is correct, it supports the idea that perhaps in some cases, the blood-brain barrier and the vasculature are the locus of modulation. Now, the third aspect of neurocapillary modulation, which I'm only going to spend 30 seconds on, is a technical point. And it has to do with the fact that because the vessels are there and because they are resistive, current will bend around them as it travels through the parachnema. And as it turns out, this has very important implications to modeling how neurons themselves are stimulated. So now the point is that the presence of the blood vessels changes how neurons are activated. So in conclusion, I present the three aspects of neurovascular modulation. The first aspect just says the neurons are not alone. The second aspect says maybe we are stimulating the vascular system directly and therefore producing really special and interesting changes in brain function. Um, and the third aspect has to do with the fact that the presence of blood vessels um, uh, will change neuronal stimulation as well. And so for all these reasons, uh, we should probably not be ignoring the fact uh, that the brain has blood vessels in it. Thank you.